listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. Hello, my name's Blake, and welcome to the first episode of Scored to Death, the podcast. For those of you that don't know me or what Scored to Death is, I'm a lifelong lover of film and music. I'm a huge appreciator of the horror genre. I taught a college course about the history of horror films for several semesters, and I've written about both film and music for many websites and magazines. In late 2013, I began working on a book that combines my passions for film and music, and like this podcast, it is titled Scored to Death. The book's full title is Scored to Death, Conversations with Some of Horror's Greatest Composers. It was released in the summer of 2016 by Silman James Press, and it contains 14 in-depth interviews with film music composers that are well known for their contributions to the horror genre, including John Carpenter, members of the band Goblin, Harry Manfredini, Charles Bernstein, Alan Howarth, Fabio Fritzi, Joseph Bashara, and Christopher Young, to name only a handful. I loved working on the book, and the response to it has been great. And ever since it came out, I've been thinking about doing a volume two, but the truth is I love podcasting. I've been co-hosting the Saturday Night Movie Sleepovers podcast for over three years, and I've been fortunate enough to be a guest on a bunch of really great podcasts like F This Movie, Wrong Reel, Hellbent for Horror, and Four Brains, One Movie. I love talking about the things I'm passionate about with other people, and I love talking to creative people about what they do, their art, the things they're passionate about. And the Score to Death book is probably the most rewarding project I've ever worked on. And I decided that I do want to continue doing Score to Death in one form or another, and the podcasting medium seems to be a natural fit. So here we are. Score to Death, the podcast. Like the book, much of the show will be focused on interviews with composers, about their inspirations, artistic process, and work, but because of the loose nature of the podcasting format, I'm hoping that I'll be able to branch away from that from time to time and explore other aspects of film music in different ways. But for today's episode, we have something very much in the vein of the book. I'm talking to the great Richard Band. He's probably best known for his work with Stuart Gordon on films like Reanimator, From Beyond, The Pit and the Pendulum, and Castle Freak, but he has also scored such notable genre fare as Bride of Reanimator, Laser Blast, Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin, The House on Sorority Row, Ghoulies, Ghost Warrior, The Dungeon Master, Troll, Mutant, Terrorvision, Prison, Dr. Mordred, The Puppet Master series, and many, many more. So I'd like to thank you for coming on this ride with me as I start this new and exciting leg of the Scored to Death journey. And without further ado, let's talk to Richard Band. Richard, I'm very excited. I have lots of questions, and I just want to thank you for taking the time to be the first person I've interviewed for this podcast. Cool. Cool. Well, it's my pleasure. I, ho- I hope it's a success. <laughs> Me too. You know, I have uh, I had such a great time talking to composers when I did the book. So this is kind of an extension of that so that I can right. continue doing that because I find it really interesting to talk to you guys. Well, great. Great. The uh now I didn't get a chance to go over some of your links, but you're you're a musician as well, correct? I am. I am. Oh, I, cool. I've been playing uh blues and rock in New York City for a little over a decade now and Uh i was inducted into the new york blues hall of fame last year Uh uh-huh cool that's great um so that's uh another passion of mine well that's great (laughs) uh yes the old the old blues Uh, i i i'm an old uh rock and roller myself well that's that's a good segue because i wanted to talk to you about your kind of early uh music career and your early influences I have read and uh, that you were a, a rocker and that you toured and stuff. Was rock and roll your first uh, initial love for music? Actually, no. When I was very small, uh, in fact, when we, uh, when, when I say we, I mean my family. I was. Uh, I think a lot of your listeners will know that my father was a producer, director, and writer, and we went over. Or rather, the family went over to Europe in 1959. Uh, my father was shooting a film in Sweden called Face of Fire with James Whitmore and uh, Theodore Bikel and a few other people. So we were in Sweden, and uh, for 
like six months. And uh, after that, he moved us to Paris. Rather than coming back to this country, we moved to Paris. Now, my father always loved listening to classical music. So in, pa- in Paris, um, you know, we had an apartment and a phonograph and all this. And I loved uh, Beethoven's Fifth and Ninth Symphonies. And keep in mind, I'm like six years old or something at this point, right? Yeah. And I used to come home from school almost on a daily basis and put the Fifth or the Ninth on our phonograph and on the old uh, telefunken phonograph and i would then go stand up on the dining room table and conduct it from beginning to end i did this about three or four days a week i just loved doing that (laughs) so classical music was my first you know real love but it was only you know maybe five years later that i started you know listening to you know be it uh, the beatles or blues certainly some motown and things like that you know in the in the uh, early early 60s and um you know obviously i fell in love with uh, with you know rock and roll and uh, you know various different types of music in, the, in that in that genre and um you know and then continued continued from there so i went from classical to rock and roll so to speak and it was when i was 11 years old that um my father was shooting a a different film uh, in uh, spain and it was in spain where actually the first night in madrid uh we went out to a dinner and in this this square uh we went across the street after the dinner to a flamenco show and that's where i totally fell in love with the guitar and the flamenco guitar playing and the, just the whole thing. And, and the next day I went and bought myself a guitar and that's what started the insanity. That was it right there. <laughs> that was it. What, what, that was was, it. What, you, what was your first guitar? What was the first? Well, it was just a, it was just a nylon string, you know, uh, I don't even remember what make it was, you know, yeah. but it was a nylon string. Uh, type of you know type of guitar. I mean, I didn't graduate to any halfway decent guitars for a few years to come. That was my very first one, you know. So, so who who remembers, you know? <laughs> and you uh, played in bands. I played in well, yeah. Subsequently, now that that happened, like I said, I was about eleven years old when sure. that happened. But uh, within a year or so, I. I was I was getting pretty good, and then I started playing in a couple of bands when I was like 12 or going near 13, and started touring around parts of Italy, because at this point we were living in Italy. We had moved from Paris, France, to uh, Rome, Italy, and uh, so we started, uh, I started playing around with a couple of bands, and it was, it was kind of weird in a funny way, because my bandmates, so to speak, they were all from their late teens to early 20s. And, you know, was the, the biggest band I had back then was like maybe a four-piece band or five-piece band. But I was still 13 years old, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it it became sort of like a, a novelty show, you know, with all of a sudden this, this young kid, you know, 13 years old or what have you, playing in a band at nightclubs around Italy, <laughs> you know. So, you know, and then from there, then I went on to other bands and then formed my own and then, you know, the, touring got more serious and the bands got you know better and uh you did a lot of original original type stuff and for, for some pretty progressive stuff jazz rock or what have you and um you know that was a, that was over a period of the next like six or seven years sure. until i finally came back to this country but it all it all started realistically all started in spain watching that uh, flamenco show that's that's where it really started are there any existing recordings of some of these these performances? Yes, believe it or not. <laughs> and no, you can't hear them. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple of ancient recordings uh, of my last couple of bands that go back uh, like forever. I mean, well, what? I've been here, let's see, from 70 one so what's that so 71 that's 40 46 46 years yeah so i have tapes a few tapes going back about 47 48 years from from my last couple of bands actually it's actually they're pretty good but they're just ancient you know done on one of those one of those old little t 
TIAC, reel-to-reel tape recorders. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's a couple of things. Maybe, maybe one day I'll put something out just <laughs> for prosperity's sake, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, were some of the uh, – I mean, they were you were p- playing in Europe, but, you know, what were some of the band names? I'm always curious about band names. The uh, one name that we had for a couple of years was called Black Sun, Black Sun, right? And another one – and here's you know a, a real brilliant mindset. Uh, we were trying to change the name of the band, and and none of us could come up with something we liked. So I said, I said, okay, well, it's changed. And they go, what's changed? I said, that's the name of the band now. <laughs> so so that, that was the last name of the band. It was it's changed. <laughs> that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, it worked. <laughs> Coming from kind of a film family, like you were talking about how your dad, uh, Albert Band, was he was a producer and, and a director, and genre fans would definitely know I Bury the Living from 1956. Yes, definitely. You know, having a love for music and coming from kind of a, a film family, was making film music kind of inevitable, or is it something that took some time to, to come to? No, it was definitely not inevitable at all, and it took a while to come to. Keep in mind that when I came back to this country in 71, I mean, I was a rock and roller. I was, what, 17, 18 years old, right? And, you know, my uh, desires at the time was to continue, you know, doing rock and roll type of stuff. Because in in Italy and or Europe, I mean, I had a pretty decent amount of success. I mean, the band was doing very well. We were touring. I was making, you know, very decent money for a 17 or 16 year old, what have you. And we got to play some very good venues, and, and, and including we were we were. I, I, by the way, I never told my bandmates this, but I mean, this I was I was the leader of the band, no pun intended. And uh, the last gig that we got, I actually turned down because my family was moving back to this country, and we were asked to open for the Rolling Stones in Rome. So it, it, when, when I told them about this a few years later, they all wanted to strangle me, needless to say. <laughs> so we were doing nicely over there. So I, I, I was like a rock and roll. I had no I, uh, idea about film scoring. I love films, of course. I grew up, you know, like you said, around a film, film family and artists and all of this. But I had no inkling about that, and um, although I was, I do remember being incredibly impressed on a couple of occasions where I actually went to visit uh, 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 the scoring stages when when my father's movies were being scored, and uh, one of which was scored by uh, Ennio Morricone uh, and his co-writer guy at the time. So uh, going to the scoring stage and watching an orchestra that kind of blew me away but i was like 15 at the time i you know i didn't sort of put it all together at that point sure uh but anyway the um no it wasn't until uh, quite a few years later that i was um i mean after i came back to this country after about a year or so of of screwing around uh you have to keep in mind since i literally did not grow up in this country when we came back i I didn't know anybody i had no friends i didn't know one person here so it was a very weird you know time of adjustment especially when you're 17 18 years old and your whole life you know was was growing up abroad so it was a lot of adjustment at that time but after about a year i decided to to uh, start studying music formally and then went to a, a private liberal arts college slash music school. And that's when I started studying, you know, formally. But after about two and a half or three years of that, I got kind of tired of academia. And that's where, that's at the time when my brother started making films. And, and of course, my father was still making films. So I took a few years off and learned the film business from the production side. So I... I became first an assistant director on several films and then moved on to production managing and then eventually uh, produced a couple of of films. And so I, I, all in all, probably had experience in doing about 13 or 14 films on the production end. So I, I learned the business, you know, from a production standpoint and a producing standpoint. But even after that, 
I was quite good at what I was doing, but it was kind of a thankless job. And I don't know if you know much about that, but assistant directing, production managing, the associate producing, all that sort of stuff, they're very thankless jobs. They're, yeah. they're very tough, but they really are thankless. You only hear from people when there's a problem. <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't hear from people, then you know you're doing a good job. You know? So it's, it's, not, it's, you know, it's not very fulfilling, on a, certainly not on a creative uh, basis. Sure. So, so it was at that time, after taking you know, a few years off from music and studies and all that and doing all these films – that I sort of said to myself, well, you know, I, I need to sort of get my act together. What, what do I really want to do with my life? You know, yeah. one of those moments, right? How, how old were you when this, when this decision came up? I guess, I guess I was in my early 20s, maybe 20, 22, 23, 24, so somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And so I took a, a holiday and I went back to Europe uh, sort of, you know, basically to contemplate my navel and to f- figure out what I wanted to do. Yeah. And I remember this moment like it was yesterday. I was, I was actually uh, in Monte Carlo. I was on my way down from Paris, uh, going going to, to Italy. And uh, I love taking trains in Europe. And so anyway, I was in Monte Carlo, and I was sitting on the beach, looking out at a rock, uh, out you know, way out, uh, you know, in the water, a, a big, a big you know, a big rock, not a little rock, <laughs> a big, <laughs> big, big rock. Yeah. And um, that uh, question just kept coming back. What am I going to do? What do I want to do? And I kept saying, you know, I, I mean, I love films. I grew up with films. I just adore films and and all that, uh, you know, but I, I, my first love was really music and I love music. And then after going through this in my mind uh, I, re- I i remember like the cartoons with the proverbial light bulb that goes on over your head when you have an idea sure. you know it, it came to me i said well if i love music and i love films and films and music and music and films what about music for films film music <laughs> and it was and it was right then and there that i go why well, hey, well maybe that's something to do and uh the rest is history. Within a few months, uh, coming back here uh, to the States, when I was doing my production work, uh, previously I had become uh, friends with Joel Goldsmith, the son of Jerry Goldsmith, who I had hired as a sound, a sound mixer on a couple of uh, two or three of the movies we were doing. He always wanted to obviously delve into music because of his dad's fame and, you know, all of that. And... Um, Lo and behold, I, I, you know, went to the distributor of a, of a film that my brother was doing called Laser Blast. The company was Compass International. They had become kind of a very big independent distributor because they had put out this small little movie called Halloween. You know, that became a huge thing, needless to say. And so I convinced uh, them to let Joel and I do the score. That's how it all started. We co-wrote the score for Laser Blast with a humongous budget of $1,000 in 1977. That was the beginning. That's that's, uh, how it all started. And that's uh, a synthesizer score. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was one thing. It was uh, Joel was... Uh, I had been trained formally up until that point, right? I had been I had gone to music school and and had studied under you know classical composers. So my my old training was was more classical. Joel had not had any training, but of course he had grown up around his father. But he was really into electronics at at the time, and was quite good at them, and had a lot of contacts of people in studios and you know, in various synthesizers at the time. So we finagled time in a studio, you know, and we finagled, you know, getting some of the top synthesizers. And, and of course, these are the days way before MIDI, you know, so yeah. all the stuff we did, you know, was all programmed and performed live. So uh, it was an interesting experience, you know, what can I say? You know, <laughs> <laughs> That's how it all started. And 
course, Joel and I would go on for the next 40 odd years working them together on and off on various things that I would bring him or he would bring me, uh, you know, and so we, we had a long, long relationship. Unfortunately, as you know, he passed away a, f- a few years ago, yeah. much too, much too young. But yeah, we were, we were very, very close friends. What was the uh, collaborative process like? It was your first film. I mean, you said you had studied formally, but uh, I, I don't imagine that you had taken classes on how to score a film at that time. Well, I had. I had. I, I had taken um, a couple of courses, uh, one of which was at a UCLA extension. Um, and so I, I technically you know, knew how to go about it. And of course, keep in mind, I knew film well, so I, sure. I you know, I, I kind of knew what I was doing, but the actual aspects of how to synchronize music with film and all that, I, I, I knew, you know, how to use the, the Knudsen book, which is what we had at the time. The Knudsen book was a, it was a, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Uh, it was written, uh, created by uh, Earl Hagen many, many years ago, and it basically was a, a like a 500 page book of bpms beats per minute translated into frames and and feet for film <laughs> yeah so you know if you wanted to if, if you were as a very simple example if you if your tempo was a 60 metronome setting right yeah. that a 60 would equal 24 frames a second that's because that's the speed of film Mm -hmm. 24 frames a second now that's a simple way to to look at it but you know when you have to have tempo changes and all you know different tempos and they all have to be coordinated with the film and things have to hit properly it's it's a it, it was quite a process to sort of put all that together and it was not uncommon in those days you know, like if you had a uh, if you had a script, let's say a ninety page script, which would equal to basically a one and a half hour movie, generally speaking. When we would have a music editor give us our breakdowns, and a breakdown was simply a music editor at that point looking at the film and describing what is happening on the film. Yeah in in uh, seconds and milliseconds minutes seconds and milliseconds right because in those days we didn't have quick time and you know we didn't have the capacity to look at a quick time movie uh, only the big guys the the John Williams and the Jerry Goldsmiths they didn't even have it then but you know they had a, a moviola in their houses or studios yeah. so imagine trying to compose and do with a, with a loud moviola, moviola <laughs> with actual film <laughs> going like crazy right yeah. and those they were the lucky guys we had to do it by memory and by these music notes that would be prepared by a music editor. So it would not be uncommon for us to have to go through, you know, three, four hundred pages of music notes with all these timings and then having to make that work and sync up with the with the film in various scenes. It was quite daunting in the beginning, but it like anything else, you know, you learn you know how to do it and and uh that's something like I said, I I had studied that so I knew I knew what I was doing. Sure. Well, relatively, it was my first <laughs> score. You know, yeah. I, at least I thought I knew. He had an I inkling. Doing. I had an inkling. <laughs> exactly. I had an inkling of what I was doing. <laughs> right. So at that point, you're getting this, these music notes from the music editor. But did you go into an editing room and actually get to see the movie before you start? Yeah, once. Yeah. It's not. It's not normally what we would do back then. Is you would go in and you'd sit with the director and or producer, you know, depending on you know who the boss was, and sure. usually they were both kind of there, you know, and they would give you their impressions on what they wanted, and you would both decide where music would come in and and yeah. go out, you know, on a scene per scene basis or a sequence or what have you. Yeah. And um, basically, that would be it. Then you'd wait for your notes. Once in a blue moon, I got to see a film maybe a couple of times if I, if I needed to. But uh, certainly for the first 15 years or so, that was it. One yeah. viewing, you know, and then all these notes to go by and, and your memory. And so you did, you're, you're talking about the spotting session? That was a spotting session. Yeah. That's exactly what it was. And at that point, obviously, things changed as technology 
changes. You're saying for the first 15 years that that was kind of the way it was. Right, right. But they're working with temp scores and stuff when you see it? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, temp scoring came in much later in the game. It was it was very unusual to ever go to a spotting session where somebody put in a temp score. That was not usual at all. Um, and I think it's it's added to the demise of a lot of good original music because it's so simple now for somebody to plop a piece of music in to a quick time movie and then you know and then if the producer likes the vibe they get married to the vibe and so that creates a lot of creative problems for the composers today yeah and it has for it has for me for for many for many years and it's very hard to to get around that when somebody gets married to something you know how are you going to convince them <laughs> other otherwise yeah unless you come up with something that they just really really adore in its place but a lot of the times you know, especially on lower or medium budget films, they don't have the time or money to, to screw around. You know, they, they're not, they're not going to say, oh, okay, well, let's see. You have a 50 piece orchestra. Let's see if this works. And then say, no, <laughs> why don't you come back next week with another 50 piece orchestra? It just didn't work like that. Sure. You know, unless you're John Williams or Hans Zimmer or, or, you know, one of the, one of the, you know, super A guys, it just doesn't work like that. So temp scoring, um, or temp tracks rather became a problem uh, later on when it when the technology became you know more conducive to an editor sitting there with a director in their spare time and saying well I wonder what it would feel like to put this piece of music in and of course then you had CDs come out so all, the whole way that you could deliver music marrying it to film became easier and easier and easier so that's that's why the temp tracks came in more and more in, in later years. In, in the beginning, like I said, the first, whatever, 15 years or what have you, uh, it really didn't exist in the same way that when you were hired, you know, you would work for whatever amount of time that they gave you and you'd what, whatever, come up with a couple of main themes or what have you. And basically, at that point, they, they kind of, the, they meaning the producer, director, or the powers to be, they would say, well, what do you got? And usually they'd end up coming over to your place or you'd end up meeting someplace where there was a piano, you know, and there you'd sit banging on a piano, your themes, and humming away and trying to give the impression of a big orchestra, of like going, bop, 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 you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever means you had, yeah, yeah. right? And then you were left alone until the time was to, to go record the thing. You know, but but nowadays, again, that's changed a lot because, you know, you can uh, keep futzing with things in, until uh, they either broadcast or the day before they broadcast or, you know, a few weeks before they go out on a film. They can just keep redoing and redoing and redoing if they choose to. So yeah. it's uh, all that's changed uh, quite, quite. There was a there used to be a, a lot more trust that was given the composers of yesteryears, let's just put it that way. Yeah. Uh, and that's something the directors always hated because it's the one thing that they didn't have control over. You know, they, didn't, they, they could control the editors along with the producer, right? They could control the editing. They could control almost everything. But the one thing that they just never knew about until it was on them and, and they were at a scoring session. <laughs> they just never knew what the music was going to be like. Yeah. Uh, so there had to be a lot of trust in, you know, in who was hiring you. And, and that's sort of the, and that whole trust factor has been minimized in, in more recent years because of, again, technology and the fact that they can plop any piece of music in there and get married to the, you know, what they want it to sound like. So it's, it's a, it's a matter of, uh, they have a, they have more control now. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. For the book, when I talked to Harry Manfredini, we talked a lot about what he calls temp love, right. which is what you're talking about is when the director falls absolutely in love with this temporary piece of music that it's almost impossible to please him with, by, with something original. Right. Right. It's a very, very tough, uh, tough assignment, especially when you consider that, uh, especially like today when, you know, they'll have like a temp, mix 
for for you know whatever reasons you know because they got to sell the movie they're taking it to sure. festivals or whatever the reasons are and so the directors and producers they're they're viewing this film that they put a temp score into dozens upon dozens of times so obviously you're going to get used to the however that feels you know and then a lot of the times you you might very well miss what what could be there if you weren't so married to it there now that doesn't mean that there are times when it works out just fine you, you know of course there are those times too but it it does take a certain amount of creativity away from sure. the composer when they're sort of told we want to score like star wars and you know, and, and you, then your mouth drops, and then they say, "But we only have four dollars to do it." <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but we want it to sound like Star Wars with a hundred-piece orchestra. And by the way, don't forget the hundred-piece choir. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Well, there's also this notion where if everybody's kind of using the same music to temp their movies, mm -hmm. that the originality of the score starts to disappear because now every composer like yourself is trying to meet the demands of the director to kind of deliver something that's similar to what they're temping with. But if everybody's temping with the same, whatever's popular at that time, that everything they all start sounding the same. <laughs> everything starts sounding the same. Well, I mean, I, you know, and, and I'm not trying to knock the person I'm just going to talk about for a second, but how many times have you gone and looked at a film and within seconds, you go, oh, there's another Hans Zimmer score. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, he has his troop of people, and he has his particular sound and all of this. And you go, good God, how many pictures do I have to go to and hear the same score <laughs> with the same sounds? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, there's no question that Hans is, without question, the most successful film composer in history from a business standpoint. There's not even a question about that. But by the same token, these incredible at business, incredible at producing, the quality, the level of quality of stuff is is way up there. It's very high. But again, you're ending up with movies that sound practically identical. Yeah, it's kind of disappointing, you know. At least for me, it is. Yeah, I want to talk about your process, especially at the beginning of your career. You were working closely with your brother and Aronia Blondes, working with the same kind of people over and over again. So how early for each film would you come into the process? Like, would they bring you on? Did you know you were going to do it kind of early on or would you come in later? No, that varied. There are some, some films that I knew that I was in there from an earlier uh, standpoint. Others came to be like at the last minute. There were certainly... Uh, quite a few where I had no idea I was doing them. In fact, somebody else was doing them until they were fired because whoever was in charge didn't like what that composer was doing. Sure. At one point, uh, especially at the latter days of Empire Films, they, they used to call me Dr. Ban because I'd constantly be called in for, for emergency surgery to, to, to redo a score that had been thrown out or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that was not uncommon. So no, that varied drastically. A film like Troll... That I knew months in advance, but in that particular case, I kind of had to because I had to write a, a couple of the uh, Cantos Profane songs that they were going to actually shoot too. So, you know, in a situation like that, you have to do pre records and all that. Now, that's a little more unusual. You know, to, not unlike when you're doing a musical, you got to be in there from way, way before. So, but, but it was kind of all over the map. Sometimes I came in literally past the last second. Sure. I remember when I was doing Prison, which uh, Rennie Harlan directed, he had another guy that he wanted to use. And so the, the, the companies, you know, gave him his preference. And all of a sudden I get a call from Rennie and, he's, and he said, uh, I think I made a big mistake. Do you think you could come and do the score <laughs> one of those calls yeah these situations are they're all over the map there's no one uh, scenario since you brought it up let's talk about prison you know 
yeah. you're credited on that one with working with Chris Stone. Chris Stone, yeah. So what was that collaborative relationship like? Well, Chris and I have collaborated on, on, on quite a few things going back many, many years. Uh, we've known each other for, well, practically as long as I, I, I knew Joel. In fact, I think I met Chris within months of meeting Joel, so it would go way, way back. And Chris was another one of these fellows who was uh, really ingenious when it came to electronics. He really, really knew his electronics and always had some of the newest synthesizers and things at the time because he was connected with a lot of the companies so he would do a lot like a lot of the beta testing sure uh, so, so so we would get things that weren't even our, be marketed for another year or two so some of the really sort of cool things that that, that we came up with were things that, that were like I said a year or so ahead of their times as far as when they became available to the public in 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 the situation with prison uh, prison was a uh, a, a similar situation because uh, at that time the wave frame had just come out and it was it was in competition with uh, Fairlight. Fairlight was being uh, subsidized by the Australian government, so it had a lot of money behind it. Waveframe was not. It was privately funded. Subsequently, it never really made it, but it really had some really really cool stuff and uh, that we used in the score for prison that good string sounds and runs and things that just didn't exist at the time yeah so it was uh in that case in the in the in the case of, of prison the composer who was let go i won't mention his name actually he's a good composer i guess it just didn't work out sure but what happened was uh, when they called me they already had uh release dates booked for the film so it was one of those scenarios where uh it had to be done in like a couple of weeks so there was really no way that i could have put it together in time with an orchestra plus they had blown a good deal of the music budget on on the first composer <laughs> sure. so yeah. you know so you put those two ingredients together and uh really the only way we could have broached it was by doing it electronically which is what we ended up doing and i think it was i think the film was better for it actually it was a, it was a different sort of feel so the entire score is electronic for that film it is because it sounds right. pretty good <laughs> yeah i know it does yeah it, it has a very organic feel to it even though it is all electronic Yeah, because especially, if, you know, if that movie came out in 87, 88, so you figure, even though the synthesizers were getting more advanced by by that point, still to have such, like you said, such an organic sound to them, that's impressive. Right. No, I, I agree. And again, part part of that is also, is not just the sounds, it's the, it's the way that it's actually orchestrated. So it was kind of one of those where my whole intent was to sort of have that orchestral feel about it, you know, uh, except to do it in a slightly different manner. So I suppose we were doing one of the very sort of first incarnations of orchestra simulation let's just put it that way sure. that be, that's become more common these days yeah so what was it like working with Rennie Harlan was he kind of a hands-on director in the scoring process or kind of left you alone he totally left me alone totally yeah uh well these are just my personal feelings I think he was kind of embarrassed at his first decision sort of crapped out you know so i think it he just decided just to leave it alone i mean i know he was more than happy with the result that i know uh but he, he um and plus there wasn't really you know a lot of like i said i think we had maybe a couple of weeks or something you know to do the whole thing so there's not a whole lot that <laughs> that anybody could have been saying or doing at that point. Can we get this done in time for the release? That was the main thing. Yeah. Well, that, and I, <laughs> I could know. be wrong, but I think that might have been, that's his first American film. Do you know? Yes, that is correct. That was his first one. It was a very big break for him. And how did he communicate to you, you know, in those early spotting sessions and stuff like what he was looking for? Uh, I don't think he did. 
to be honest. I think it was one of those, again, it was one of those situations where everybody was up against the gun. Sure. There was just no time for it. Yeah, there just wasn't. And in fact, to be honest, I don't even remember a spotting session. Now, I could yeah. be wrong, but I, I, I don't even think we had one. Yeah. It was just, you know, grab the thing and get it done. If I recall correctly, I think I heard in an interview or, or read an interview with him that he had said that he had temp scored that film with the, with the alien score. Do you have any recollection of that? Mm, I don't. I don't, because I, I, never, I never heard a temp score on it. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you're writing with somebody like uh, Chris Stone, mm-hmm. like how do you divide the workload? Well, every situation is a little bit different. In that particular situation, it's not like we both sat down and went to our respective corners and and said, you know, okay, you do these cues and I'm going to do these cues. It wasn't one of those situations. It was more we actually got together and sat down in, in his studio because he had, a, he had a, a, a good studio at the time with a lot of these you know, instruments. And we would actually sit down and, in a sense, improvise the whole damn thing. But I would pretty much chart it out, uh, not like, a, not, not like a, a chart necessarily with, you know, like a chord chart or something like that. But I would chart it out as, as far as uh, I do a loose breakdown of sort of where I thought, it, you know, it should go within within the scene. So, you know, whether to play something up or down or Mysterioso or something with a, you know, with a driving force and all that. And we came up with with a few, call them uh, uh, sonic templates that we used in various places. And so it was not the traditional type of score where you know, we sat down with music paper and wrote it out. Sure. It was a more improvised kind of score, although we did have a couple of very specific themes and all that. And, um, you know, and we used those a- appropriately. And uh, so it was, it was, but every, every collaborative situation is a little bit different. Chris and I had been working over the years on, on various things. Uh, we had done a bunch of swamp things together for a few years before that uh, the tv series and so we kind of knew each other's styles and work methods and all that so it was it was pretty easy going actually when you say sonic template you're talking about like synthesized tones and stuff or more uh the notes and and things like that well it could be both they're not mutually exclusive in some cases let's say it was a very uh like in prison, one of the main sort of cool sounds that came from the waveframe were these string sounds that were like a, a variety of glissando effects. Where you'd have like a string section going up and up and up and up and or in, or in reverse. And so that's something that we utilize. That would be an example of like a, a sonic template we would use in various places. Other ones might be a certain low end percussive devices like a, a beat or something that just that amp that keeps amplifying or getting stronger, you know, which could be like a bass drum type of thing that, you know, that gets huge and then diminishes. So you have something like that goes boom, 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 boom. you know, you, there yeah. are devices like that. So you think of it more in those terms that you, that you, we had a bunch of those devices that we would use in, in various points in the film along with various um, melodic structures as well so it's kind of a combination of all of the above what is typically your process like do you write from beginning to end do you find key moments within the film and then use those as kind of tent poles to start the creative process and then work around those well again i don't have one single process sometimes the process is dictated by different things like if i had two months to do something my process would probably be be different than if i had two weeks to do something sure so a lot of it depends on circumstance a lot of it depends on budgetary matters in other words if i'm if i'm doing something 
for orchestra, it's a whole different approach than if I'm doing it for a simulated orchestra, right? Yeah. Or something that I've done a lot of, as you're probably aware of, where I've combined the two a lot. Sure. You know, where I where I have, say, a live string section, a live brass, but I do the rest electronically or what have you. So it, it's, it's all different circumstances, but in a more generic, uh, I guess a more generic answer would be I when I'm when I'm getting a new project the first thing I look for is the theme I, I try I, I, I'm a firm believer in in thematic music and sure. most of most of my films have always had some kind of a theme or at the very least um, you know very identifiable motifs but I, I like themes I think it's one of the I think they're sorely lacking today, and it's, I think it's one of the things that, emotionally speaking, an audience grabs onto. And so, if used properly, themes can evoke a lot of emotion in your audience. And I don't. I, I think a lot of films don't have enough of that these days. Generally speaking, I mean, some composers definitely do, and I would think overall, your your better composers they're pretty damn good at writing themes and knowing how to, <laughs> yeah. you know, how to, to take advantage of that. So really, if I get a project, I'm trying to see, to first find out the thing about it that is different. In other words, I'm trying to identify what the hook might be, what's making this film or what's making this film different. What's, what should the music be saying to an audience that's going to help bring out the emotions necessary and i mean that can it can be a lushness it can be a theme it can be uh, percussive in nature it could be uh, something that you know drives hard drives fast it could be slow but I, I like to try to find at least one if not more ingredients that makes it different than your average run-of-the-mill sure. score yeah. Do you want something that identifies specifically with that film? Right. I, so, and that's always that's always been my my aim. Have I succeeded all the time? I don't know if I've succeeded all the time, but I think a good proportion of the time that I've managed to to find that ingredient. Let's sure. just put it that way. And I think that's important. Yeah. And when you say theme, you don't necessarily mean specifically like a main theme, but a score can have multiple themes for characters or for relationships and stuff like that throughout the film right well yeah i mean it can it can be multiple themes but usually there's usually there's either one or two things that are i mean ideally there's always one or two things that really can identify and make that film different and i i like to try to identify what those are yeah. that's what i like to try to do and that's that's sort of combining the thematic idea with a hook you know there's, there's you got to sort of find a, a hook there's got to be a hook to throw out to the audience something that they'll remember and and, and with something you can come back to that works on an emotional level of some kind uh, now a film of yours which score i absolutely adore and i think maybe i could be wrong but it's a score that comes to mind for me when you're talking about what you're talking about is I love the score for The House on Sorority Row. Oh, yeah. The opening theme to that movie is gorgeous and kind of very lush, but yet because of the aspect of the music box, the melody that you wrote for that, uh, becomes in a very kind of Morricone way, works at both diegetically and non-diegetically in the film. It's both a, a piece of music within the film, but then you also use it as kind of the score outside the film. That's correct. That's correct. It was interesting that you mentioned that because I was uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago I was clearing out some some stuff in one of my rooms where there's lots of old interviews and reviews and stuff, and I came across a bunch of reviews uh, for the house on Sorority Row, 
they were all really, really, really great music reviews. And the one thing they all said in common, and and it's been sort of a commentary for many years, is something to the effect, I'm paraphrasing, something to the effect of, how could he manage me, talking me about me, how could he manage to make such a gorgeous and lush theme exists in the slasher movies of the of the times yeah you know <laughs> which it in one way you would think it would work totally against the genre but my thinking was 100 percent the other direction my thinking was it's exactly what the genre needed and what the film needed to elevate it to a whole other level and bring it from you know another b slasher film you know to a critically a uh, pretty well acclaimed film. Sure. Well, yeah, especially, I mean, that came out in 83, you know, by the time that had come out, sure. Manfredini was still using strings and stuff, but because of the success of Halloween in 78, there was a lot of scores, especially for the lower budget horror films were kind of mm -hmm. going much more towards uh, a synthesized score. But then, right. you know, you could, came out with this beautiful orchestral score for, I mean, and it's a fine f film for that genre, but I, 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 I think the job of music in the film has, it has multiple functions, but for me, it can really add gravitas to a film. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. And uh, kind of production value in a way. And I think this is a perfect example of that. Well, yes. I mean, you're a hundred percent right. And, 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 and in saying that, you have to also keep in mind that one of my longer-term goals was, and still remains to this day, but definitely was when you go back to the Empire days, okay, and I was, uh, I was like on a mission from God, let's put it that way. My whole thing was to take these films that were being done at Empire, which were all B-films, but the one thing that these B films had in common is that the production values were pretty damn good for a B film. But I wanted to take it to a whole other level. I wanted them to be considered like A films. Now, they were still ended up being B films, but the fact that I was very insistent across the period of a, certainly almost two decades to get my way in doing the bulk of them with orchestra or at least combinations thereof brought empire to a whole other level of respectability and a lot of those films if i mean can you imagine some of those films if they had been done in the more common fashion of the day with electronics and yeah, yeah. you know and things like that I mean, you know troll would have never you know had that orchestra pit and pendulum uh, uh dungeon master with the with the uh, london symphony Ghost Warrior with the Royal Philharmonic, uh, you, you know, I mean, yeah, you go yeah. on and on and on. And so it, that was kind of my mission. I was constantly pushing, pushing, pushing to get budgets that could give us the opportunity to have uh, at least some orchestra, if not all orchestra, in there. And unfortunately, it got to the point where the films were just getting too expensive and the scores were... Uh, the scores were never very expensive, but I was I was blowing all the money on the orchestra. Yeah, I mean, if I were a smart businessman, I would have done this a whole different way, you know, and uh, gotten a few synthesizers and done it that way. I could have made some very good money, but that's that was never my aim, and uh, that's why I can look back on on a, certainly a good deal of those films with quite a good amount of pride because we were trying to provide an. an an A score to a B film, <laughs> basically, and uh, and in a lot of case, in a lot of cases, it lifted the entire production value. I think tremendously. Oh yeah, I would totally agree. Um, I think a, a prime example of that. Not to say that the production values, uh, like you said, for the budget were you know weren't impressive for a film like Metal Storm. Yeah, Metal Storm was a little bit of a different case, but yeah, it was still a very low-budget film comparatively, even though Universal was involved. And uh, 
and, and but that ended up being one of the most expensive scores that I ever did because it was done here in Los Angeles and it was all a straight union job. Yeah, and it was uh for for the day it was, I mean this was nothing compared to what things are costing today. But I remember distinctly. Uh, here's the big difference of de- dealing with a little independent company versus Universal Pictures is mm-hmm. that that particular movie. If you remember, it was a 3D movie when it was released. Yes. And it was released during the summer of the 3D movies. And the three 3D movies of that of that summer were, one was called the, the Forbidden Zone, something the Forbidden Zone. Space, Space Hunter, I think. Space Hunter, the Forbidden Zone. That was, a, that was the first one. Yeah, with Molly Ringwald, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Then the second one was Jaws 3D, which was Universal. And the third one was Metal Storm. Now, the thing is, Metal Storm and Jaws, uh, Jaws 3D and Metal Storm, <clears throat> though they were both universal, and at that time, the 3D setup, uh, were, were they had to be using the same particular lenses on the projectors, on, the, uh, on all the projectors. So if, at the time, it was, a re- it was released uh, in its initial release, I think in about, Thirteen or fifteen hundred theaters, which for the time was pretty pretty good release uh, uh, nationally. But uh, keep in mind, it had to have the exact same lenses put on these projectors. So what happened? What ended up happening is that since Jaws 3D was first, and then after its two or three week run, Metal Storm would come in and use the exact same projectors. There was no room to move at all as far as the schedule. Yeah. And I only got 11 days to do over 78 minutes of music for a full orchestra and five five synthesizers. Sure. So that was totally insane. But the point about Universal and the difference of a little independent company and Universal is Universal kept saying, look, we, don't, we, we can't even give you one more hour as far as the delivery. But here's another 20 or 30 grand for get yourself a couple more orchestrators or get yourself another arranger or whatever. Yeah. So they, they kept, I mean, not throwing money, but they certainly did put in another, I don't know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 at the time because they couldn't afford to ha- have the schedule be off even by an hour. But but because that's insane to do. I mean, it's like, uh, well, for me, it was like, you know, somebody coming to me and say, listen, we need you to do Star Wars, but I, I need it done in 10 days. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, you know, and so that was like it was like totally insane. Yeah. It got done, you know, and all that. Sure. But that was a that was that, that was a fun and huge action score, needless to say. So basically their remedy was we can't give you more time, but we can get you more help. <clears throat> there you go. That was the rem- that was the remedy, which is better than nothing. Yeah. You know, for some of the, I would imagine a lot of people listening to this, a lot of people that read my book are not necessarily you know, music people, but they're fans of the music and, and, and the films and stuff. So, I mean, what exactly is the job of an orchestrator? The orchestrator, basically, when I write a piece of music, if I do my own orchestrations, that means I start out, usually the way I do it, I usually start with a music paper that usually has nine, nine staves on it. And I'll do a breakdown of the orchestra on those nine staves. So in other words, let's say one one stave might have your high woodwinds, another stave might have your low woodwinds, two staves might have your string section, high and low, another two staves might have your brass, and then another two staves might have your percussion. So you have your basic basic groups of an orchestra. So you write out the piece, and you've got it there as a breakdown. If I then am an orchestrating, if I'm orchestrating, or if I hire another orchestrator, they will then take that sheet of music and they will then split it out into the proper configuration, which usually on a big score like that, usually will end up being a, a, a piece of music paper with possibly 28 or 30 staffs, not eight or nine, because mm-hmm. the flute has to have its own 
the uh, you know the oboes, the clarinets, uh, the, the strings are going to be at least four staves, right? So you're going to have your violins. Uh, actually, a lot of times five staves. You're going to have your first violin, second violins, your violas, your cello, your basses. Same with brass. You're going to have your trumpets, trombones, then French horns, then tubin, tubas, Wagner horns. So they all get broken down. So what might, like I said, what, what would be like two staves on my initial sketch would then be broke, two staves, say, for strings, would then be broken down into an orchestrated version of yeah. that, which would have five staves, let's just say. So it's a much, much bigger piece of uh, real estate music-wise with a lot more notes on it. Sure. Now, from that part, the orchestrated part, then that part will go to the copyists. And the copyist is the person who will look at that orchestrated version and they will copy down each part for each instrument of the orchestra. That's basically how, how it works. So basically they're taking your ideas and then kind of translating them for the orchestra. No, it's not that. It, it, it's, I mean, it can be that. It can yeah. be. And in, in most of the stuff in my case is it's, it's all there on that initial piece. It's just broken down more specifically. Yeah. Um, it, for each player. Yeah, yeah, for, for each, exactly, for, for each player. Mm -hmm. and then there are other scenarios where, let's just say, say, say it's the same thing where I'm doing, um, but this time let's say I'm doing a very loose sketch on those eight or nine staves, that first, that's the first part of things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes then you might give that, uh, if it's very loose, you might give that to a, an orchestrator and that orchestrator will act sometimes as an arranger slash orchestrator. So he's going a little bit further than an orchestrator. The orchestration is pretty, pretty technical. The arranger part is he's, you know, he's doing filling in some stuff there. He's making an arrangement out of your idea. So it's a little more, little more uh, creative. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. So there are different degrees of all of that, depending on the composer, depending on the score, depending on the time, depending on all of these things. Sure. Now, how many players did you have for Metal Storm? Because it's a pretty large. That's a big, yeah. That's a big group. That uh, well, I had three different groups. The largest group, I think, it was probably around 80, 85, something like that. Uh -huh. That was the largest. The smallest, probably around fifty-ish. And you had a number of uh, electronic players as well. Yeah, we had uh, we had. Uh, I can't remember, two or three live synth players, and they were all on Fairlights, actually. So we had three Fairlights uh, going li live with the orchestra, which was an interesting way to do it. <laughs> so it's all, all together. Yeah, it was literally Well, there's no together. time for the overdubs, right? Well, there was, yeah, there was. <laughs> although there, there there were a few cues in Metal Storm where, where I went in, and we did do pre-recording with some of the fair lights and then added the orchestra on top of that. Mm -hmm. So there were a few, uh, you know, I, I can't remember, like maybe three or four cues that w where, it, where it was in that other, other dimension, you know, where it was kind of heavily electronic, but with orchestra in the background. Those few cues we brought in as pre-records, and then the orchestra would play against those pre-records. Unfortunately, Shirley Walker's not with us anymore. But yeah, on that yeah. film, you worked with people that went on to, you know, have their own successful careers as composers, like Gary Chang and, and Shirley Walker. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Gary uh, was working. Uh, uh, this is before his composing days. He was working in Santa Monica. As a as a synthesist, and uh, he had a contract with Fairlight. I think this was just at the time, just before they, the the government ended up selling their interest. That I think it was like within a year or two that they sort of 
sort of went by the wayside, or or they. I don't think they went by the wayside. I think something happened where they became more of a sound effects library initially, or something like that. But yeah, Gary was fantastic. He was a great find, and yes, he would go on to be a successful composer. And of course, Shirley went on to do lots of different things including uh, still working with me on various projects. In fact, I made her one of the very first women to come to me in, to England to uh, conduct the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra yeah. on Ghost Warrior. That was another example, by the way, where we did a lot of pre-recording here in Los Angeles uh, because the movie had to do with the bringing a samurai back to life, like eight hundred years later. Yeah. So there was a lot of a lot of really interesting Japanese influence, and I managed to use a lot of uh, instruments that were inherited by Emil Richards, one of the greatest percussionists in our business, who was a disciple of the famous composer Harry Parch. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you know who Harry Parch was? I don't know. Uh, well, you, you, this is a guy you want to look up. To. I mean, it's just he's fascinating. He he built his own instruments, and and because they were so unique, he had a whole he had to devise a whole new way to write music so that people knew how to play the instruments, and some really unusual stuff. And Emil Richards, he inherited almost all of Harry's stuff, and I went down to his warehouse. Of course, this is many, many, many years ago. And I walk into a warehouse. So it was, yeah. you know, the last thing in Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, when you walk into that hallway <laughs> with all the hidden treasures, and like you can't even see the end of it. Yeah. That's what that's what it felt like to me with Emil Richards at his warehouse. We had instruments that had literally some of which never had been recorded, and we had eight players, all percussion players, play on these sessions that we did a group for in Los Angeles for. Oh, a good four or five days. And then we lugged all of those 24-track, two-inch tapes all the way over to England, and we put the Royal Philharmonic on top of that. So we had like, we had 48 and then 72 tracks going at the same time. Wow. It was, it was insane. <laughs> it was great, though. Okay, I think we're going to stop there for now. I know we haven't gotten to some of your favorite films yet, and for that I apologize. But tune back in in two weeks for part two of this in-depth and exclusive interview with Richard Band, where we will discuss the artistry of Bernard Herrmann, working with Stuart Gordon, the differences between motifs and themes, and many other fascinating topics. If you've enjoyed what you've heard so far, the book Scored to Death Conversations with Some of Horror's Greatest Composers is available on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle, Barnes & Noble, and many other places you buy books. Or you can order a signed copy from me directly. Just contact me through scoredtodeath.com or find me on Twitter or Facebook at Scored to Death. My other podcast, Saturday Night Movie Sleepovers, can be found on iTunes, Google Play, and most places you find podcasts, and on Facebook and Twitter at Sat Sleepovers. You can find Richard at richardbandmusic.com or on Twitter at richardband underscore. And I should note that the short clips of music used in this podcast were used strictly to put aspects of the interview into context, to audibly illustrate specific things discussed, and for educational purposes. Much of Richard Band's music and most of the music discussed in this episode is available on Spotify, and I will try to create a Spotify playlist to act as a companion and quote-unquote further listening to today's podcast. The soundtracks discussed on this episode were Laser Blast, which Richard composed with Joel Goldsmith. It can be found on iTunes and also on CD from both Full Moon Records and BSX Records. The soundtrack to Troll can be found on CD from Restless Records or on vinyl LP from Entrada. Prison, which Richard composed with Christopher L. Stone, can be found on CD from Entrada, on iTunes, and on the original vinyl LP from Very Sarah Bond. The House on Sorority Row can be found on CD from both Intrada and La La Land Records. Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin 3D can be found on CD from Intrada. And the soundtrack to Ghost Warrior can be found on iTunes and on CD from Intrada. I want to thank everybody for tuning in to the premiere episode of Score to Death, the podcast. I'll be posting part two, the conclusion to this in-depth and exclusive interview with Richard Band in two weeks. And I have a lot of really great interviews slated for the coming months. So I hope you stick with it. This is going to be a lot of fun. 
I'm really looking forward to continuing Scored to Death in this new medium, and I hope to see you next time. Later. Later.